Hey everyone, Day here, and welcome back to my Let's Play of the Great Ace Attorney Chronicles. In the last episode, we did learn a few things. The primary thing that we learned is that Mr. Egbert Benedict's real name is Ashley Graydon. We still don't quite know his positioning along the chessboard of this case. But we do have that much to go off of. And right now, we're just trying to prove that he was in the pawn brokery. Um, I know that he... I want to say the very last thing that we were going over was Mr. McGilded leaving anything else within the pawn brokery that would make Ashley Graydon want to go back and return to the pawn brokery. And we know from earlier, like way earlier in the case, that is that he claimed there should have been two of those discs but there was only one found in McGilda's jacket pocket so does how is this all going to relate don't know exactly but that's enough preamble let's just hop back into it i'll be very disappointed if i didn't save because i don't feel like i saved <laughs> i don't have any okay it's, it's where it needs to be i'm gonna save it right now just in case Audio issues or anything of the sort happens, we're gonna be good. It takes slot number eight. With that, we'll just hop back into it. There must be a reason for that, I'm sure. I just don't know what it is. I want to say they're speaking upon the disc. Yes. Because um Von Zeeks and Mr. Gregson, Inspector Gregson rather. We're speaking over, like, what Lord Strongheart probably has Inspector Gregson working on that he has to be super hush-hush about. For now, I need to focus on exposing the fact that Mr. Graydon is lying in his testimony. Good luck with that, sir. Good luck. And I have to be half the reason we're getting further in this game right now. There's no tone to just saying for me gilded, but that item belongs to me. Sure it does, sir. Will you care to explain how this belongs to you? As you will observe, a communications officer such as myself commands a fine salary. You are certainly exquisitely dressed, sir. <laughs> I can't speak because of the time period, but you know, some people in this day and age dress beyond their means. It, it certainly doesn't mean anything today, but back then I'm pretty sure the stations of people were definitely presented in their dress. So you see, I have little need to make use of the services provided by the prom brokery trade. However, I did once find myself in difficulties having misplaced my post whilst on an errand. Oh, I went over this already, now that I think about it. This was done in the last episode. We'll still go over it though. Which is why I pawned my fine black overcoat to the broker in question. We just go a little faster. You claim that was your overcoat? Obviously. And in my haste, I clean forgot the music box disc was in his pocket. And yet, there is a note that reads for me. Yeah, you know what? Actually, no. I'm not going to sit here and listen to this again. There's just no time. There's no time. Okay, let me just go over the synthesis. Okay, there's a note on the desk saying for me gilded, but the item belongs to him. The redemption ticket was stolen from me by the accused. Okay. But he's saying she took it. We can't and um, I think Ryanosuke himself pointed out, we can't actually dismantle this with the truth because then it will it will make Gina guilty of, you know, wrongdoing with the last case. I proceeded at once to the shop in order to explain my situation and redeem my article. In the end, of course, the disc was taken by the police. In other words, I had absolutely no reason. It's gonna be this one. It's definitely gonna be this one. What do we present, though? He had no other reason. Go back. Gentleman's overcoat. I'm going to present this. This disc was deposited at Wendy Banks on Magnus McGilda's instructions. You knew 
that and you went there with the intention of obtaining it for yourself. Objection. Conjecture again. And in any case, the disc was taken into custody by the police that afternoon. The witness had no reason to visit the Palm Burgery again that night. Objection. Sorry, my learned friend. But that's not true. What? Well, that totally wasn't how he would say it. <clears throat> Mr. McGilded had another article in pawn at Wendy Banks. As this second pawnbroker's ticket proves. Ah! Whoa, that stink eye is insane. <laughs> there were two articles belonging to Mr. McGilded and Wendy Banks pawnbrokery, and the reason you broke into the shop that night was to recover the second one. Together with your two accomplices, the Skulkin Brothers. Ah! Look at this. It's obvious we're on the right path here. Hmm, this is the second ticket, is it? What had the man deposited? The article description reads, One small box. It sounds like the only- th I mean, the only thing we saw in there that was a small box was what Sholmes used to deposit the, um, manuscript. So, I don't know. I mean, I don't- I have very vague recollections of that storeroom right now, but I want to say that was the only box I remember actually seeing in there. A rather vague description, it seems to me. Are you suggesting that I broke into the palm brokery with these clowns in order to steal some trinket box? I believe there are adequate grounds to suspect that you did. This is absurd. Why on earth would I do such a thing? Once the article had been forfeited, I could simply walk into the shop and purchase it. There would be absolutely no need for me to resort to theft. That's a good point. That's a very dang good point. Hmm, indeed. The witness makes a solid argument. So that means that for some reason, this great and fellow needed the small box that very night, does it? Objection. It's time to put an end to this nonsense, my lord. Could you be a little less cryptic, Lord Von Zeeks? <laughs> a little less cryptic. Von Zeeks, please. I don't... Interesting. I hope everything is recording, okay? I do hate to ruin my learned friend's argument, but the truth is quite incontro incontrovertible. But then I the question no small box was taken from Winnie Banks' palm brokery. And rest assured, the prosecution can prove it. What? How can you prove it? Good gracious! Inspector, show the photographic print to the court, if you please. Oh, are we- are we- are we about to get the other one? Fine! No freaking Lee! I've been waiting for this moment my whole life. <laughs> like seriously, I've- I've- I've been waiting for this moment. Yes, sir! What prints? The prints from the secondary camera. Come on, Ryanosuke, keep up. These- <clears throat> Those prints were taken from one of the detective security cameras. Ah, oh, hell, it's right handed recorders again! As previously explained, using this plan of the shop layout. The victim's establishment was finished with automatic cameras at two locations, and was set to capture the counter where Mr. Winniebank received his customers, and the other was set to capture the shelves on which articles were placed for sale once forfeited. According to the information on this ticket, McGilda's small box had been forfeited already. Two days before the incident at 9 p.m. on 13th April, to be precise. Which means it would have been on the shelves of forfeited items in the shop front. Now, what I have here is a print taken by one of the cameras about two hours before the incident. That's at 11 p.m. on 15th April. Oh, that green box? Hmm, the victim certainly had a very full shop in where to pay. I've seen worse. And then here we have another print. Alright, juror number three. Is he juror number three? I want to say he's juror number three. Alright, come on. It's time to stereoscope it up. This one was taken about two hours after the incident. Oh, I see. So we have two pictures to compare. Brilliant. Brilliant. The 
sure I must say that placing them sword by sword leaves me cold. <laughs> leaves them cold? <laughs> Dear me, that's starting to make my head ache. Obviously, at Scotland Yard, we consider theft as one possible motive in this case. We explored the possibility that something had been taken in addition to the victim's life. So your men had already compared these two prints thoroughly, Inspector. Yes, sir. It's like I'm trying to get that gravelly part in my throat, but it's not working right now. We counted every single item in each of these two photographic prints. You, uh, yeah, I think you have to make sure it hasn't been touched, Grixon. And the yard's conclusion is that exactly the same number are present in both. Hmm. In other words, nothing was taken from the palm bakery and all it's in question. It doesn't have to be taken. At least, not what the object perceived in the photo. It could have been something we removed from inside of something that we see within that photo. But then that item was returned back to the shelf. You know... Something you obviously Scotland Yarders and all did not seem to think of. In my Latin friends, assertion is nothing more than a hopeful fantasy. Ah! Stop it, Rianosuke! Calm down, relax. You have this. I don't believe it. If I could have just shown that he'd stolen McGilda's pond box. <laughs> I might have been able to break him down at last. Right, Runa. I've been thinking. I wonder if these two photographs really are exactly the same. I don't know. I don't think we have them yet. Because otherwise I'll do my little thingamajigger. <laughs> For, I can't I can't stereoscope it up, but I, there I can just flick my controls, stay back and forth between the photos. What? So, Consul, in the light of the evidence put forward by the prosecution, what is your position? It seems that, in fact, on another question, nothing was stolen from the victim's establishment. Do you accept the prosecution's assertion? Absolutely not. I don't know. Could there be some hidden discrepancy in these two photographic prints somewhere? There's no... Shoot. Mm. Or use evidence? Dang, I was hoping we would just get this so I could like flicker through them, but I'll just say point out a discrepancy. I will go that route. Did it allow me a chance to look at it? Let me see. It's, it's really hard from this perspective to see if anything has shifted. You know? The horse foot is where it was before. Like, nothing seems shifted. Everything is like right where it was over the label. At least from what I can tell. Wait, no. No, that's not it. Mm, maybe I went the wrong route. I just assumed that there was something wrong with this, but maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. I'm not seeing anything that looks tampered with. Alright. I wasn't sure at first, but... There is a clear discrepancy between these two prints. Oh, man. Let me see, let me see, let me see. I have to look... A little more. I won't be able to just guess this. There's too much going on for me to just be- to just guess. Um... Lamp... I wanna say that photo... With the hats? There's like something behind it? I can't tell. There's hats and stuff. I give up. What?! You must identify the location in question for the court console. Indicate the precise location of the discrepancy of which you speak. Oh my gosh. Before that, let me, um, 
check out my court record. Nope, I still don't have them. Butter, dutter. Okay, if let's just say if I did the evidence. What would be the evidence? Oh. I think this was the evidence. I won't be able to oh, oh this thing I it was like I noticed it only after I was fiddling over it granted these two prints are almost identical oh my gosh I saw that at the exact last second I was getting ready to just press something randomly however there is one minor discrepancy between them it's not even a minor discrepancy it's a pretty huge move it's more of a move than the items on the desk. What? When you view the two pictures stereoscopically. A single area stands out as being different. The location of this small box. <laughs> Seeing Lord Von Zeke's with one of these is hilarious. Let me wait. Uh, unbelievable. <laughs> He's still looking at it. By Jove, you're right! How extraordinary! What this tells us is very simple. Mr. McGilda's small box was indeed not stolen from Wendy Banks on the night in question. However, there can be no doubt that somebody picked up this particular box and then returned it to its place on the shelves. Are you suggesting that the small box originally deposited by Mr. McGilded is in fact... I mean, it's an inference, but it's looking highly likely. Yes, the very same small box I just identified in those photographic prints. Mindless guesswork. What if it was? So a box was moved on a shelf. Nothing was stolen. Which means, quite simply, you don't- you can't say that officially. You have no idea if they gain access to the innards. That nothing has changed. That- that may be true, but... Alright, Mr. McGilded's box wasn't stolen then. But doesn't the fact that it was moved like that change things? Oh! They tricked me! Oh, I was bamboozled! No, you're right. It changes nothing. That smirk is so sinister. Holy cow. Is that a smile on Mr. Graydon's lips? Wait a minute. What am I saying? Of course it changes things. <laughs> Sometimes picking the wrong answer leads to like hilarious. <laughs> hilarious answers. Or just discourse between characters. <laughs> that was funny. The dude was lighting up like a Christmas tree with that smirk. He's like, oh my gosh, I'm about to <laughs> I'm literally getting ready to tap dance out of here. Or so I thought at first. <laughs> so I don't even lose points for this. Awesome. They, they, cause they fooled me anyway. I went too fast, but I just assumed the first one was the option I wanted. But actually, I say it changes everything. Well. Well. It's changed your mind, certainly. And that capricious behavior earns you a penalty, my learned friend. Ugh! I really should have thought that through better. Yeah. Look before you leap. But, but Gonsu, if nothing was stolen and all that happened was that this box was moved slightly. How can that possibly alter the state of affairs here in the courtroom now? The crucial point is the fact that what was moved was a small box. In other words, we have to consider what might have been inside that box. What are you suggesting? Ponzix, please. Keep up. That smirk! I hate that smirk. It's kind of, it's like super sinister. I'm suggesting that we need to examine that box as soon as possible. I don't, I think whatever was in that box is completely gone. The dude was smirking it up. There is no way. A vital piece of evidence is sitting on the shelves at Mooney Banks as we speak. That will be necessary. Some little box belonging to a man who died two months ago can't possibly be relevant to this trial. The 
The court does not uphold your objection, Lord Von Zeeks. Bailiff, arrange for an officer to go to Baker Street at once. Obtain the small box in question and bring it back here for further examination. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. Some judges could be scuffed, but this judge is loyal to the cause of justice. Much appreciated. Man, Lord. Calm down, sir. Please. Relax. He's still smirking. That's why I know nothing is going to be in this box. Nothing. He took it already. We should have a report within half an hour. I think perhaps we should recess for a short while until the evidence is brought forth. To be hoodwinked by such a farce. Huh. Disappointing. I beg your pardon, Lord Von Zeeks. If you have any... <laughs> Oh no, I am not saying that. <laughs> I could just picture Lord, I mean, um, the judge just like banging him slightly on the head with his little tiny gavel. Like, what do you think you're talking about, Von Zeeks? This is nothing but a smokescreen. A Nipponese specialty, it would seem. What are you trying to say? I won legally twice. Well,. Granted, the McGilded case was very scuffed. I don't even, I actually know I don't count that one at all. But the other, the last case, I 100% count. My learned friend has persisted with the same line of reasoning from the very beginning that this witness's intent was to steal an autograph belonging to Mr. McGilded from a palm brokery. Yet, common sense tells us that none of the articles have value enough to be worth stealing in the first place. Exactly! No, I don't believe that. It would be beyond absurd to break into a place for the purpose of stealing such commonplace property. Hmm. If. <clears throat> if your lordship recalls, Mr. McGill had perished two months ago, immediately after the conclusion of his trial. He's really pushing this to the end, to trying to push this into his favor, isn't he? A trial in which he was found not guilty. A trial in which it was established. He was the upstanding member of society his reputation implied and fucked. So, I propose a toast to my learned friend and his most... Insightful defense. Oof, that hurts. That hurts a lot. The autocoast, a substandard member of society pond, were entirely ordinary. A black overcoat that just happened to have a music box disc in one of his pockets, and a small box. I assure you, I wouldn't accept even if the man tried to make a gift of such things to me. Hmm. You know, that does make rather a lot of sense. It's not as if it was gold or jewels, is it? Though goodness knows Mr. McGoody was rich enough. You got deposit cash at a palm burger. I'm quite certain of that. The prosecution's argument is undeniably compelling. It is incumbent of, on a defense not to boister his argument. To explain what possible significance these commonplace articles pawned by this fine citizen could have. Well, Consul, is your argument in fact demonstrable? Are you able to show proof that the disc or the box are in any tangible way related to this case? Freaking Von Zeeks! Are you serious? Ah! Can I prove that they're related? No, I don't think I can. I'm not even gonna look. No, I can't. Well, um... What's the matter, Runo? We know that they're related, don't we? We both bought a pieces of evidence. Yes, of course. You and I both know that. We know McGilda's true character. And we know the disc is significant. Even if we don't know why. But if we explain all that to the court at this point, we will have to acknowledge that McGilda's acquittal two months ago was a mistake. That the defense's argument was flawed, based on false information. Oh no! And that would mean admitting that Gina committed perjury. But Jenny, it has to. We have too much McGilded stuff in my dang 
We, we, it's just too much McGilded stuff. Like, it, it all boils back to him. This guy isn't dead. Okay, maybe he is dead. <laughs> but dang it, doesn't it feel like he's still alive? We got McGilded notes cases here and paper. This is stuff in here that we haven't used yet. And that's going to be the only way we can use it is by being forthwith about that information. So we're going to have to come clean. Could it be that Von Zeke's knows? Why wouldn't he know? The guy was scuffed. I think even a caveman would know that McGilded was freaking scuffed. I knew that before we even got to the day verdict. It's obvious. Is that why he's doing this now? Because he anticipated everything? I don't know if you and I don't know if he anticipated everything. There were times where Von Zeke was was surprised, very shocked. Like, if he anticipated everything, I don't think anything would have, like, caught him off guard. And he would have been leading every step of the way. That hasn't happened in this case. But maybe... This could be a great opportunity for us. Sorry? What do you mean, Iris? Well, what is it that you always say, Runa? Sooner or later, the truth comes out. Every time. All right, the exact significance of the things that McGilded deposited with Mr. Windybank. Something that only Gina can explain to the court. But if I put her on the stand to testify about that, it could critically damage our chances of winning this case. What's the right thing to do here? We're gonna have to, we have to have her testify. The truth! Like, th that's what I love about these games. They, they, the truth is more... Is more important than anything else, basically. And eventually, even the prosecution realizes this kind of stuff. Now, in this game, we're getting it from the defensive side more so, and we want Rio Nosuke to be an honest fellow if the game allows it. My lord, the defense would like to make a proposal. Oh, what proposal, Consul? While well, the court awaits the arrival of Mr. McGill's small box, I would like to call the defendant, Miss Gina Lashrad, to the witness stand. The defendant? To what end? It's to do with the various articles deposited at Wendy Banks by Mr. McGilded, my lord. Mr. Schrod has information relating to them. I believe it would be beneficial for the court to hear what she has to say. It would prove the significance of the articles in question once and for all. Well, well, things are becoming interesting. <laughs> I presume you've considered the implications of the testimony you're proposing. In particular, the impact it will have on the accused's standing, and indeed, your own. Um, sir, the fact that I'm even asking her to do this, I think it's kind of shows where my standings are currently lying. Regardless. I have. Lord Von Zeeks, but you care to explain that last remark? The prosecution accepts the defense's proposal. <laughs> That's not explaining Von Zeke's, but I will allow it for the time being because I already know you're about to try to bulldoze all over us. I move to interrupt the cross-examination of the current witness and hear from the accused herself. <laughs> Please! I don't want to hear from, uh, what is this guy's real name again? Ashley? Very well, if you have no objection. So, the court will now hear the testimony of the defendant, Miss Gina Lashrade. Lashrade, Lashrade. I literally, I know, I know. I have never been consistent with her last name, like, ever. You witnesses currently in the stand may step down until further notice. Then I shall bid you good day. Don't smile too soon. Wait. You, sir, shall remain in this dawn while Miss Lashrad testifies. As you wish. Alright then, Gina. It's time. I know this will be hard, but please, put your faith in me here. Ah, I love it. Good luck, Bruno. Oh. Oh, I guess I shouldn't be happy then. Ah, her face. Ah, oh, Gina! The articles that Mr. McGilded had deposited in Wendy Bank's pawnbrokery. 
are intimately related with the Omnibus case, the trial of which was heard in this courtroom two months ago. Yes, and I remember this young lady being brought before me in that trial as well. That's right, my lord. Her testimony helped to establish the innocence of the defendant, Mr. McGilded. The Omnibus case was intriguing, to say the least. And now, here we are, all are again. The same players in that trial facing each other once more. He's been wanting this. <laughs> A twist of fate, perhaps, my Nipponese friend. Considering what we and Nosuke went through mentally, maybe even a little emotionally, with um how he felt about McGilda's acquittal, like you could tell like <sighs> obviously Von Zeeks doesn't know about that, but that's the thing about not fully knowing people, right? Ooh, that dog scared me for a second. I'm like, um, what is going on? Probably didn't hear it, but he was stumping. Allow me to recap the events of two months ago. An old brick maker was stabbed to death in an omnibus running along London's winter streets. Apart from the victim, there was only one other person in the carriage. Mr. McGilded. Naturally, he was the prime suspect for the murder. <laughs> Honestly, when you look at it from that perspective, it was so obvious, it's obvious, you know? But as the trial progressed, another possibility emerged. That the murder, in fact, took place above the defendant's head on the roof deck, with the body then being dropped through the skylight into the carriage below. It was Ms. Lashrod whose testimony brought that possibility to light. At the time of the incident, Ms. Lashrod was concealed under a seat in the carriage, hoping to pick the pockets of unsuspecting passengers. Then immediately after the trial, having been acquitted of the murder, Mr. McGilded died in this very courtroom in the most extraordinary of circumstances. A mystery that remains unsolved even now, two months on. See? <laughs> A mystery that remains unsolved? This sounds so sus. As indeed does the omnibus matter itself. Be that as it may, I recall neither the disc nor the small box being mentioned in the course of those proceedings. Mr. Shrod, would you tell the court now, please, what really happened in the omnibus two months ago? I mean, know what you mean i'd already said all, all of what i knew and what about everything you told us yesterday from inside your prison cell please miss lashrod this is extremely important what remember little girl if it transpires transpires that you willfully withheld information in a trial two months ago the Home Office will seek to prosecute you for perjury. And, naturally, you will lose all credibility as a witness. Although, let's face Fox, you have little credibility to lose. Jenny, don't listen to him! Please, you have to trust the room now, now! Uh, Iris, we're on your side! All right then, I don't talk. It's the right choice, Gina. Well, it would seem that my learned friend is hell bent on bringing the entire courtroom down about his ears. So be it. <laughs> oh my jeez! I must confess that I'm struggling to understand what on earth is happening here. However, it would appear that Mr. McGillis pawned articles in that extraordinary case on the omnibus. Open secrets of which we have been hitherto unaware. So, Miss Lashrod, you will now give your testimony before the court about the events of two months ago. You will reveal the truth, a commodity sorely lacking in your original statements. This is it then. Everything is going to come out. Like Von Zeke said. This could bring the whole courtroom down about my ears. But as a lawyer, I'm prepared to take that risk. 
It's going to be based on a jury, too, though. Witness testimony. The real truth of the Omnibus case. Truth is that Brickmaker Cove was in the cabin of the Omnibus the whole time. When the Irishman dragged me out from under the site, I saw that disc on the floor. All of a sudden, I heard a scream from over my yard. And that pair on the roof duck went all to go from the slopes. That's when my goodness slipped the driver at 17 to do a run to the one shop roundabout. He threatened me not to snitch. Not to say nothing to no one about what I'd seen or heard. Good grief! This is outrageous! What you've just told the court bears almost no resemblance to your testimony two months ago. As you say, my lord. Then... Then... There's every chance I may have educated an error in Mid Gilda's trial. It sounds very much to me as if the man deliberately deceived his court in an effort to cover up the most wicked of schemes. Yeah. Oh yeah, adjudicated. I th I completely butchered that. But when don't I really? Without doubt, your lordship is correct. A great injustice was done in this courtroom two months ago. The actions of the accused in that trial, of this witness, and of my learned friend are entirely inexcusable. I don't believe it! The whole trial was a farce! It was all lies! And my good fellow was rotten to the core, just like that pickpocket. Don't forget that lawyer from the ace. They were all on it together. If that was the case. You're wrong with the lot of you! Mr. Noriodo, the lawyer there! He didn't know nothing about it! Humbug! I don't think so. Were you really expected to believe that? He really stunned everyone up, didn't he? With an operation to get the man off scot free! Unforgivable! Stop! The lies have to stop! Stop! Yes, the defense made a terrible error of judgment. I intend to take full responsibility and suffer whatever consequences are deemed appropriate. However, it's imperative that the court allows the witness to elaborate on her testimony, because the true significance of McGilda's pawned articles must be brought to light. Very well, my learned student friend. Changed his title. Given the depths of calamity you have just plunged yourself into, this may well be worth hearing. Well, considering there is a second game, officially, I'm not worried. <laughs> Words fail me. The situation is utterly deplorable. Mr. Naruto, it's not like we knew. Come on. Yes, my lord. I would decide upon your fate following the conclusion of this trial. Of course, my lord. But I mean, Mr. Naruto. <laughs> Wait. I had it for a second, but now I'm, I'm just losing it again. But I mean, Mr. Naruto. No, counsel. Proceed with the cross examination. I'll do my best, as always. The real truth of the Omnibus case. Truth is that Brickmaker Cove was in the cabin of the Omnibus the whole team. And you were hiding in the cabin at the time as well, weren't you, Miss Lashrod? If I remember rightly, in the storage compartment underneath one of the seats. Yeah, that's right. It's pitch black under there, so you can't see nothing at all. Now when you were testimony two months ago, I feel certain that you claimed Mr. McGilden was the sole passenger, did you not? Boss, testimony, my lord. That's... that's what he told me I had to say. But it's important that you tell us the truth now. We're Mr. McGilded and the victim acquaintances. I don't know. But I did hear them talking a lot. What were they talking about? I don't think you could hear them, right? But I couldn't eat too well, but if I had to say, I think it was about money or something. I kept talking about buying and not buying. Hmm, perhaps business dealings of some kind. You would believe her now? I thought everything she said would be under heavy scrutiny. Well, anyway, they got louder and louder. It started to sound like a proper fight. I was pretty scared by then. I hardly dared to breathe, and then all of a sudden, I heard a noise like someone keeling over on the floor. It was blaming loud and all. And I believe you let out an involuntary scream. Yeah. That what gave me away. <laughs> when the Irishman dragged me out from under the seat, I saw the disc got a fool. 
was the disc you saw. This disc. Here? I reckon it probably was. It was written. It could be the other disc we don't have. Cause wouldn't there? I feel like that would hold blood on it, wouldn't it? So I want to say the second disc that guy mentioned is probably the disc that she saw, not this one. But that's just obviously my guesswork right now. Like I'm trying to remember to inject my own personal thoughts into the case instead of me just reading. It was right next to the glove laying on the floor. Could this disc have belonged to the victim, perhaps? I don't know, but McGillard picked it up pretty smartish. And then he set the curve with the knife in his belly up on the seat. What did he say to you at that time? He told me not to say a word about what I'd seen or heard to no one. But the disc and all. It was dead scared. The way he was looking at me, I thought. If I didn't go along with it, I'd get stuck with that knife too. Hmm. Then he started asking me a load of questions. Like what my name was and where I lived in that. He asked me about being a diver too. But after a while, what had happened in the carriage was noticed. Yet, that's right. This it was a kind of rapid noise. All of a sudden, I heard a scream from over me head. And that pile on the roof that went off to call the slopes. <laughs> the slops. That's hilarious. <laughs> Cause I have, I for one have never heard that one, but I know that, you know, people sometimes call up police or cops pigs. So pigs and slops, that's, it's just, that's why I was chuckling, darn it. <laughs> there were two gentlemen occupying the seats on the roof deck, I believe. That's right. They, they must have looked down through the skylight and noticed the cove with the knife in his goods. I really wish he wouldn't describe it like that. Oof. When they screamed, the driver pulled up on the horses and McGillard got me out of sight. Out of sight? Where? Back under the seat where I started off. Once the carriage came to a halt, the two coves from the roof ran off to fetch the slopes. They immediately left to fetch the police. It would appear they were entirely unrelated to the incident. Hmm. So that left me gilded, the driver and you still at the scene. Yeah, only the driver didn't know I was there because I was under the seat. I heard the cupboard door open and a voice from outside. The driver, yes. He also testified in a trial, I believe. Oh yeah, this guy. A fellow who went by the name of Beppo, if memory serves. What did McGilded and the driver say to each other? I don't know what happened, and stuff like that mainly. That's when McGilded slipped the driver with some tin to do the run to the pawn shop round about. That pawn shop obviously being Wendy Banks on Baker Street. J just a moment, Consul. D do you mean to tell me that the driver gave false testimony in that trial as well? A hop stick excursion to the pawn brokery slipped his mind when he was in the start. money says a lot of things and sometimes when it speaks you don't <laughs> that's actually bonkers man everybody's a liar McGillard took off his coat and gave it to the driver he folded it up all careful like before I handed it over when I saw him do that I remember thinking the coat and what's in it it gotta be worth a few bob Yes, Gina was sure the disc must be worth more than Mr. Windybeck was suggesting, wasn't she? I remember her quibbling with him over the price that afternoon at the pawn brokery. The, the driver looked pretty happy when McGillard flashed some brass in his face. He would have run it off and let it a lick. Then the book tried to call to me and told me to come out from the drugs cabin. He threatened to me not to snitch, not to say nothing to know what I'm about what I've seen or heard. Threatened you how exactly? Told me I'd only be able to scrub her off if I did exactly what he told me. Which included giving- oh. <laughs> I 
I don't know who that was. Which included giving false testimony in court two months ago. Dear, that's it? There was only one other thing he said. Which was... He told me I'd have to hang on to the ticket from the pawn shop. Make sure not to lose it. The ticket? Well, I never! Said that if he didn't show up to get the ticket off me before two months passed, I had to go to the pawn shop and pay the money to keep it in Luke. To stop it being forfeited. He left me with some breasts to pay for it. See, it sounds like he knew that he was going to disappear. This is why I say he's still alive. This is why I can't let it go. Because it's like the more I think about it, it's like it, he set this set up for him to come back. If he doesn't, all right, I was totally on the wrong trail. But I'm just saying, as far as how it looks, it just seems like everything he was putting building blocks in place to be gone for a while. And so in so being gone for a while, that's why he gave her money and stuff. Like I know he's rich, whatever. A couple of brass ain't nothing to him, but still. It just seems like he was plotting this from the get-go. And I really feel like he is the one leading that led <laughs> That led this Ashley Gray Graydon to Gina. Like he he was like pretty much the only other person besides the people in the court that could describe Gina so well, right? So I, I don't know. That that's kind of just my thought process. It could have been someone else, but I can't think of who that someone else would be that could potentially lead Ashley to Gina. But really. We on earth would Mr. McGill have done such a thing? Depositing his overcoat with a pawnbroker before the arrival of the place it makes no sense at all. And especially since he was the only one that knew Gina would be at the pawnbrokers. Correct? Like, that, it just... It just feels very McGilded like Unless he... Unless he somehow gave Ashley Graydon that paper before he perished in the omnibus. I suppose that's possible. He told him to wait until the day of because he probably knew Gina would wait till the day of. So it was all coincidence in that way, but I feel like that is more of a long shot than it just being he's still alive. There would seem to be only one logical explanation, my lord. Well, McGill did have the driver deposit at Wendy Banks was something he didn't want the police to see. Something very important that he needed to hide at all costs. Anyway, after that, he let me go. So late to be for the cup is showed up. Well done, Gina. It can't have been easy to tell the truth like that. Jenny's really put her faith in you, you know? Yes, and to thank her, she'll have to face a charge of perjury once this trial's over. <sighs> Better than murder. Better than a murder. So I need to use the time we have now to get as much information out of her as possible. It's time to really go for it. I saw every statement. I I suppose I should. Didn't I already do that? Oh, another thing. What's that? Take a look at those two. Isn't it strange that they've been whispering to each other the entire time? Even thing to look at them. Yes, that is strange. It looks like they're having a secret discussion about something. I don't like that. I don't like that at all. I'm not sure I'm completely comfortable with that. I wonder if there's anything I could do about it. I pressed all these sentences, didn't I? Interesting. Hmm. What am I supposed to be presenting and towards what? I'm 
trying to- I don't know. Eviction was assured with three eyewitness testimonies. Huh. That, I don't think that has anything to do with anything. This is gonna be a toughie. This one's definitely gonna be tough. Pop Wendy Bank? If, if if it gets to a point where I'm like looking into this way too long, I'm cutting I'm gonna cut something out of it, but I'm I'm gonna try to think about this as quickly as possible to avoid needing to do too much of that. Cause I like trying to make it as accurate as possible with my thought process and stuff. Mm. So we're not on this right now. We're I don't I don't think I have any I'm gonna press everything again, see if anything new happens. I figure if something new happens, I won't be able to fast forward it. Wait, let me see if I can. Excuse me. Is there something you'd like to share with the court, Inspector Gregson and Mr. Graydon? Inspector! Mr. Graydon! Whoa! Blimey, you're trying to give me a heart attack. You have been whispering to each other for quite some time now. Tell us, what is the discussion about? Discussion with this fella? Who are the other ones to shine? You think I've got anything to say with a shady gent like this? And I have nothing to say to this uncouth detective. I think he deprived me of that disc that was rightfully mine. They're clearly been talking the entire time I've been cross-examining Gina. Is this if they've been negotiating? Hmm. Thank you, Miss Lashrade. Lashrade. <laughs> I cannot. Thank you, Consul. I've heard enough. I believe we now have a reasonable understanding of what actually transpired on the omnibus. It would appear on that night two months ago, a negotiation was taking place on the omnibus. A negotiation concerning this disc. However, Matters did not run smoothly. When the parties involved began to quarrel over price, Mingoda took what he wanted by force. At the expense of the other man's life. Which proves my point! The disc is clearly extremely valuable in some way. Although I don't understand why as yet. And two days ago, precisely two months after the omnibus incident, Mingoda's coat and its contents were due to be forfeited. I didn't know- wait. I always lose her voice. I didn't know what I should do with the ticket. I mean, the gold died right after this road. I knew that. So you decided you would try to claim the articles as your own. What have I not, eh? They were only going to be forfeited. Why shouldn't I have gone? Anyway, you can't blame me for thinking about it. They can act no crime. Mr. Lashrod, Mr. Lashrod, it would appear Mr. Magoody was prepared to kill in order to take possession of this disc. Yes. See, it's all coming together. It's all coming together, a little bit. Because she's a thief, he had to assume that she would try to take it, which is why he sent Ashley, Brayden. Do you know why that would be? I? I ain't got a clue. But I reckon it must be worth a fair bit of breast. He was probably gonna sell it. And he couldn't blame me for thinking that. They could eat no grain. Hmm. My lord. The evidence your lordship requested has been located and is ready for the court's inspection, sir. What is with this box? A mysterious little box deposited by McGilded two months ago. There's no doubt in my mind that it's a key piece in this far reaching puzzle. And with that, my learned friends, we are going to end this particular episode. I know, I know, I hate cliffhanger endings myself. I hate to be one of the people actually presenting the cliffhanger. But we're in this together, at least for the time being. <laughs> I don't I don't know what happens either. So take that 
as much as a consolation as possible. But I have to say that I, I just cannot... I know I, I had this problem earlier with the whole blood stain situation. That was terrible of me. But I, I just... This has been something I, I have said from two cases ago. Like, pretty much after McGilded's case ended, and I saw that bus fire, how the case hasn't the mystery of that particular incident has not been solved and everything seems to be adding up that mcgilded is still pulling puppet strings from the gallery somewhere like it, it just feels like he's still alive out there you know so i can't drop it i, I just can't it's just it's just too much of him in every piece of everything for me to believe that this guy is literally just ash from within the ashy omnibus incident. Like, no, I, I don't know. I just, I have a very hard time letting that thought process. And especially right now when I, I wonder what was, what would be in the box or what was in the box. Cause it's a possibility that Greg, Gray didn't, Gray didn't, Gregson and Gray are super, super close for me. But Graydon could have opened the box and retrieved the contents of what was within that box himself already. So it's very hard to decide if this is even going to offer us anything. Like maybe there's a fingerprint, some blood, I don't know. Maybe there's something else on the box, but I don't know if there's really going to be key evidence still retained within that box. But I guess only time will tell and we will learn that in the next episode. So thanks so very much for watching up to this point. I do very well, I do appreciate it. And until next time, I hope you all have a great and wonderful day. Toodaloo, bye.